You may have placed hundreds of central lines, and to be honest, most of the times it's just an unchallenging routine procedure, and you may get by just fine. But if you want to take your CVC game from merely good to excellent, we've put together a mixed bag of pro tips. So what about labs? To begin with, follow your local protocol. Our local guidelines state that with an INR above 1.8 or a platelet count below 50, you may consider giving procoagulants or transfusions. However, our guidelines also state that an experienced operator can place a line regardless of labs, if he or she does a pre-scan and comes to the conclusion that the procedure may be carried out safely. There will sometimes be a discussion regarding choice of cannulation site if the patient is coagulopathic. In my opinion, coagulopathy is not a concern if you are a skilled central line inserter meaning that you are able to clearly differentiate the artery from the vein and master the implant technique. It helps if the pre-scan shows a large vein. I prefer the subclave approach because of the longer distance from the vein to the skin, thereby preventing back bleeding from the vein to the dressing. You may of course add epinephrine to your local anesthetic to avoid skin bleeding. Should oozing from the sutures or the insertion site occur, just apply pressure to the puncture site and give transfusions or procoagulants that is needed according to the labs. Local procoagulants like StatSeal may also be used. I'm well aware that an arterial puncture in a non-compressible site in a coagulopathic patient would be very unfortunate. Here's my personal take. A central line is an invasive procedure and I always make sure that I agree with the indication. But if the patient needs a central line, I would place it regardless of labs. I believe I'm a very experienced central line operator. I always do a pre-scan and if the patient is coagulopathic, I choose the best location. If I don't have labs, I don't wait for them. In particular, if the central line indication is inability to place peripheral lines, I wouldn't want to waste time trying to draw peripheral blood. I would place the line without labs as they don't change my decision to cannulate. But once again, this is my approach. Know your limitations, follow your local guidelines and ask for help if needed. This is extremely basic, but we've noticed how some colleagues are unable to get a good image of the vein due to gel being dislodged from the probe head. This is how we do it. Place gel on the probe. Grab the protective cover as shown, catch the probe, and let the assistant pull the cover. Make sure to remove all creases from the probe head and place the elastic band without rubbing away the gel. Fold rather than pull the cover. We like to have the ultrasound cable placed on a custom hanger. It makes the whole procedure a lot easier and you can leave the probe hanging while not in use. Avoid excessive amounts of ultrasound gel. Simply begin with a little dollop in the middle edge of the area rather than putting it all over the place or on the probe itself. This is extra important if you use the microconvex probe as too much gel makes the probe slippery against the skin. And always avoid getting gel where you'll puncture the skin. Wipe with ster sterile gauze if you need it. It sounds basic and it is basic. Just tap on the side of the probe to determine which side of the ultrasound screen it corresponds to. Always drape the patient to allow for both subclave and IJ axis. To shift to the oblique approach, it's just a matter of moving the probe a few centimeters cranially and rotating it 45 degrees. Stay put by the side of the bed. There's no need to move up to the head of the bed. You can just as easily cannulate the IJ standing by the side of the bed if you use the oblique approach. It's a humanitarian obligation to make every procedure as painless as possible. Local anesthesia is good for the patient, but it's also good for you. Cannulation is easier if the patient doesn't scream, breathe heavily or move around. Make sure you do the local anesthesia part as an ultrasound guided procedure. Use a thin standard needle for the subclave approach. Get hold of the extra long thin needle pictured here. Take care to anesthetize the point of cannulation, the suture site, and then inject towards the vein. Do it in plane and use this as a test run for the cannulation. Note though that the thin needle can sometimes be more difficult to visualize and it's harder to do the lateral displacement. If you can't visualize the needle perfectly, that's okay. Don't push it too much, just inject superficially and the local anesthetic will spread along the fascial planes. There is no need to aspirate, as the small amounts of local anesthetic, averaging about 5 milliliters in most cases, is never as toxic in an average sized adult patient. You may need to adjust your puncture site based on the patient's external anatomy. In this patient, 
the shoulders in the way for optimal needling. See how I make a slight rotation where I find a good puncture site without losing sight of the vein. Avoid multiple skin punctures. Use the same site to avoid oozing. Rather than doing a new skin puncture, just do the superficial lateral displacement, which is easy in most patients. Don't aspirate as you advance the needle. That will make it harder to hold the cannula for lateral displacement maneuvers. It's obvious from the ultrasound image when the needle has punctured the vessel. A slight give may be felt and you will often see the tip in the vein. This is when you should aspirate. Then remove the syringe and quickly cover the bore of the cannula to prevent bleeding and air embolism. Sometimes you are willing to wager your firstborn child that you are in the vein, but you get no backflash of blood when aspirating. It may be due to clotting in the cannula. Retract and flush the cannula. With air, preferably. Keep the end of the guide wire in the plastic loop when you perform the superclave procedure to confirm the guide wire tip position. This avoids contamination of the guide wire and enables manipulation of a dislocated guide wire. After having inserted the guide wire, always do an extra check to make sure that the, it is inserted in the vein before you dilate. If possible, verify the guide wire tip position close to the right pulmonary artery, as we mentioned in the superclavicular fossa video. Use the number 11 blade before dilatation for anything larger than 7 French, unless the patient is an octogenarian with chronic steroid use and really soft skin. Make an incision that's just right in size. If it's too big, bleeding will occur and you may have caused an infectious complication. Dilatation is crucial when inserting any catheter with more than 2 lumen. Dilate the tract with intermittent guide wire movement to make sure it moves freely. Rotation of the dilator may be beneficial and very helpful. This avoids the frayed tip and the kinked guide wire that can arise if the cannulation has been made at a steep angle in a thicker vessel wall. When removing the dilator, place a gauze covering the insertion point. Make sure to grab the guide wire as seen. Don't fill the CVC lumens with saline before the procedure, but rather when it's in place, aspirate blood with one syringe, in this case the 2cc syringe. Then inject saline from another syringe to avoid contamination with blood in the saline syringe. Suture through steroid strips to avoid cutting fragile skin, for example in those with long-term steroid use. Then use a barrier film like Cavalone to protect the sensitive skin. Note that despite all our precautions, there is still a small rip of the skin when this drape is removed. There you have it! A few things we've learned along the way. The devil's in the details. Good luck!